This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. How much of any of this can you take as truth? How much of documentary inherently reduces people to spectacle? There's several moments in our film where our own subjects kind of speak back to us about the way we're framing things, you know? Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Karen Hahn. And I'm your other host, June Thomas. Hello, June. So (laughs) judging from the clip that we just heard, it sounds like we'll be talking about documentary filmmaking this week. Hey, Karen, you are 100% correct. The voice we heard belongs to Morgan M. Page, who co-wrote the documentary Framing Agnes. We will also hear from Chase Joint, her co-author, who also directed and appears in the film. So Framing Agnes, it's a really genuinely fascinating and beautiful film, which, as we'll discuss in the interview, is hard to describe, but it's not at all difficult to watch and to enjoy. Mm -hmm. It's a film about trans history. Uh, Its starting point is a series of interviews that happened at the UCLA Gender Clinic in the 1950s. But it asks a lot of really interesting questions about whether it's even possible to tell society as a whole the story of a subsection of the population, who are themselves, of course, very diverse, with honesty, accuracy, integrity. Um, One of the many ways in which it's a little different is that some of the participants in the 1950s study are embodied by contemporary trans performers who also talk about their own lives and their own experiences. I hope everyone will check out Framing Agnes because it is just truly fascinating. Anyone interested in documentary will, I think, find this film really interesting. Yeah, that sounds so, so interesting. And I can't wait to hear your conversation with the two of them. But before we get to that, what can we look forward to in the Slate Plus segment this week? So this film is the product of many collaborations. But Morgan and Chase live not only in different countries, but on different continents. Oh, wow. So I was really curious about how their collaboration worked. And uh, they 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 told me some really interesting stuff about how they work together and how they work with other people too. That's so funny. And also feels like a, a, such a high hurdle to have to clear. And I'm very, very excited to hear that. Slate Plus members will hear that at the end of the episode. But if you're not a Slate Plus member, but do want to hear that segment, why not join Slate Plus? As a member, you'll get no ads on any of our podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and member exclusive episodes and segments from our show and other shows like The Waves, Culture Gap Fest, and Amicus. Sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash working plus to access all of Slate's content and support our work. All right, let's hear June's conversation with Chase Joint and Morgan Page. Chase Joint and Morgan M. Page, welcome to Working. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So I wanted to talk with you both because Framing Agnes, the documentary you co-wrote and which Chase directed, is currently available on Kino Now and will be streaming on all digital platforms as of February 14th. It's an extraordinary movie. And as soon as I saw it, I knew I wanted to talk to the people who made it on this podcast. My first question is that this is not a standard documentary. 
And honestly, it's a little bit tricky to describe, so I'd love for you to do that job for me. Uh, Morgan, could you describe the premise of the movie and then get into a little bit about its unique format? I mean, this was the big question when we were trying to get it made, is how the hell do you describe it? (laughs) Framing Agnes centers around the real-life case history of a woman named Agnes from the 1950s who approached the UCLA gender clinic back then in its early days. And she sort of inadvertently became a really key figure in uh, medical understandings of trans people and sociological understandings of trans people. And essentially our film starts with the premise that Chase went looking for her case file and happened to stumble across the case files of not only her, but um, of several other people who were in the same clinic around the same time. We bring these case histories to light and all the questions that they bring up through a mixture of interviews, uh, reenactments of some of the... um, Transcripts. Yeah. Thank you, Chase. Reenactments of some of the (laughs) therapy transcripts. Yeah. Well, one of the many things that are a little bit different in this film is that we see it being made, or a version of that making. Uh, Chase, you actually play a character in the film. I wonder, actually, if you're comfortable with me describing it that way. And then, as Chase Joint, you have conversations with the actors who embody some of the individuals who took part in that UCLA study. So, first, what did you think about me saying you play a character? And second, I'm curious if, over the course of the film's evolution, you were always going to be on screen? I am not at all offended by your summary of my playing a character, in part because one of the things that we're thinking about in the film is how all of the trans and gender nonconforming subjects who were at the UCLA Gender Clinic in the mid-century and also all of the contemporary actor-collaborator participants are also playing characters on screen. And so we can think about that historically and medically, the ways in which trans people were forced to rehearse very particular narratives about their lives and their histories Mm -hmm. and their desires in order to to gain access to the services that they needed. And then also the kind of pressurized, mediatized environment in which we all live, where trans people are forced into a certain kind of creative articulation. And so I am playing a character. I am definitely trying to think about the legacy of someone like Harold Garfinkel, who was the sociologist, asking the questions of these trans and gender nonconforming subjects at UCLA, but also the similarities and strange resonances between the kinds of questions being asked by researchers and medical technicians and the talk show hosts of the decades that followed. So one of the central conceits of the film for people listening who might not have seen it is that we flip the stage of the research environment. We flip the investigative questions of the sociologist and put it on the stage of a talk show. And one of the reasons we do that is because it is haunting and disarming when you recognize the similarities between the kinds of questions. The let me tell stories about trans bodies, let me ask really mm, violently curious questions of people's lives and histories and motivations. And so of the many things that the film is trying to reckon with, we are constantly trying to think about how power operates and the way in which we set frames around our understanding of trans experience. And so for all of the ways in which I, as director, co-writer, am asking actor collaborators to be themselves, but also walk toward these historical subjects, I too need to be doing that kind of work and and implicating myself as a part of that machine. Yeah. I mean, it's super interesting. I just happened to be looking at the IMDb page where there is the trailer playing. And even in those tiny clips, you can see, Chase, that you are acting one way when you are being Garfinkel. And then when you are talking with the actors in another scene from the movie, your affect is very different. The flip for me to the talk show is in part a nod to the fact that the talk show was the place where many of us first encountered gender nonconforming subjects. You might be wondering where people go when they are experiencing problems of a sexual nature. 
It's very striking, very interesting, very beautifully done. Um, and as you say, that you know, one of the motifs is the, the talk show. And I guess it's part of this long running pattern of cis people learning about trans lives through the medium of interrogation, you know, whether that's on a chat show or in a medical setting or maybe in a documentary. Morgan, I'd love to hear why you were sort of so taken by that dynamic of the chat show and, and interrogation, I guess. Well, like many trans people of a certain age, I grew up on TV talk shows and it's a place where trans people are held up as we've frequently been as sort of freak shows, um, as Mm. something to gawk at. Right. So I think there's something very Mm. emotionally interesting there and resonant with our experiences everywhere else in life. You know, it's the most compressed version of the way we are treated, whether we're talking to doctors, as in many of the subjects of our film, uh, or employers, anywhere in our lives. We're constantly, trans people are constantly asked to give an account of ourselves to satisfy cis curiosity. And I think the talk show is uh, the perfect encapsulation of that. Yeah. I I just want to get back to something that, um, that we were talking a little bit about before, which is kind of being in the movie. Um, Chase, could you just kind of talk about how you decided you were going to be on screen? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't mean to be trite or cute when I say that there really was no other way. I I think that based on the kind of formal constraints that we put into place about asking for this kind of collaborator doubling and by virtue of the fact that I am the person asking the questions of our subjects – I necessarily needed to come to the table also as who I am off screen. And so for all the ways in which we try to remind that there is no off screen in the film, we do need to take account for the fact that at the end of the day, we are making a documentary that some people have far more control over than others. And for all the ways in which we want to show you our team and all the ways in which we want to reveal and continue to break those boundaries and those barriers, ultimately, power does reconsolidate in ways that can be very harmful if not treated Mm. carefully. And so there are circuits of accountability that happen on screen and then circuits of accountability that happen off screen. And I know that, you know, part of our chat today is about process. And I think Morgan and I could spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the behind the scenes of the edits and the constant chats and the feedback loops and the screenings in process and, you know, the emergence of Jules Gil Peterson on screen as our extraordinary historian interlocutor is actually a product of this ongoing feedback loop where we are reckoning with the question, why are we making this film? Who are we making it for? Why does it matter? Etc. I would just add another thing to think about in terms of Chase appearing in the film and this approach where, you know, I also appear in the film. Most of our crew appears in the film. We constantly move right. the camera back to break our idea of mm-hmm. the frame. Right. And I think on one hand, that's about, gesturing towards the fact that the framing of these trans historical narratives is not neutral. It's been done very specifically by hands that are not ours or the subjects, Mm. but also to say something broader about documentary itself, like putting aside trans people for a moment, there's no narrative that is neutral Period. If you are seeing a narrative, it has been carefully selected and curated for you by people, often not the same people that narrative focuses on, right? And I think that's one of the more interesting and thornier questions that our project tries to bring up is like, how much of any of this can you take as truth? How much of documentary inherently reduces people Uh, to spectacle Mm -hmm. or to the ideas of the documentary maker rather than how they might present themselves. And I think there's several moments in our film where our own subjects kind of speak back to us about the way we're framing things, you know? Yeah, there are some really striking moments like that. I'm thinking of Barbara, right, Jen Rich's character, who can just, you know, say to Garfinkel, <laughs> where are you, you know, where are you getting this from? You're wrong about this. There's no reason to be lonely. People choose to be. We are here. Have I said something wrong? 
I think you're wrong about a lot of things. And that's, you know, you just kind of realize, I, I don't see that usually. That's not a dynamic, or typically that's left in a narrative, uh, even if that happened between the, the speaker and the, the documentarian. Um, this may seem very shallow, but one of the things that, that I was thinking about when you when you both were speaking was how, as you say, we see the making of the film where we see, you know, you, you bring the camera back and we see a lot of the actors being primped, which may be a weird way of putting it, but, you know, they're getting their makeup touched up, they're getting their hair fixed. And as I say, in some ways that it feels shallow for me to say it, but like the people who are speaking look great. And that is not always something that is, you know, not a gift that's given to talking heads on documentaries. They often, you know, no effort was made to make them look good. Is that something you were actually conscious of or is that, again, my protection? Oh, I love the question. And it's not shallow at all. It's strategic. One of the things we're trying to think about is artifice, is performativity, Mm -hmm. is glamour. And to take seriously your point about the legacies of representation in documentary film, but also one of the things that we're trying to think about in the project is the impact of celebrity and iconicity. So we recognize the way that Agnes becomes an icon of a certain kind coming uh-huh. out of a very particular moment. But, you know, one of the things I like to say in Q&As is if you ever have insomnia, we encourage you to go Google stock all of our collaborators because each of them are their own incredible portals into trans cultural production and trans yep. artistic history. And yep. in a moment that is so precarious... For trans people, it was critical to us as makers to be asking those to join us who were already thinking about their relationship to the public sphere. So all of our collaborators understand themselves to be public mediatized people who are hyper aware of the way in which they are represented. And so that is baked in necessarily into the fabric of the film as a whole. We'll be back with more of June's conversation with Chase Joint and Morgan Page after this. Since signing the 15% pledge in 2020, Macy's has increased the number of Black-owned brands they carry eightfold. Now, during Black History Month and all year long, they're continuing their support for Black creators, changemakers and causes. Join Macy's in celebrating Black history and Black brilliance by shopping Black-owned brands. And you can help fund scholarships for students at historically Black colleges and universities by donating online and rounding up in store for UNCF. Learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. That's macy's.com slash purpose. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1, 2023. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Whether it's to ask us for advice on a creative problem, tell us a guest you'd like to hear on the show, or to share your own creative triumphs, drop us a line at workingatslate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to June's conversation with Chase Joint and Morgan Page. Can you talk about how, again, I, I'm not sure if I'm using the right terms because I'm thinking of casting and actors. And, I, you know, I, that seems odd to say in a documentary, but, you know, it, they are embodying. Um, can you talk about how kind of the process of I don't know, signing up those people and, and the negotiations that you went through, if, uh, if any? I mean, I think one of the key things in terms of finding our collaborators was 
that we specifically drew on people who are already within our networks, um, who we have longstanding relationships with in one way or another. Like Stephen and I are very good friends going back a decade, you know, (laughs) I've known Zachary for a very long time. And part of that is because there needs to be a level of trust in the type of Mm -hmm. questions we want to ask. And then the other part is that we had a lot of conversations ongoing about how people's stories fit together or what themes would resonate with our collaborators in terms of what we would want to get out of them, right? June, you know, I'm I'm laughing, even though I understand that no one will see me laughing as you're sort of (laughs) stumbling or or questioning your use of certain words like casting. But again, similar to performance, similar to acting, casting has such a pressurized um, significance as it relates to the presence of trans people on screen. And so we are mm-hmm. thinking about casting, actually. Mm-hmm. We are thinking mm-hmm. about who arrives in what position on screen and why. And of course, mm-hmm. we're not asking the question in a way a traditional narrative film might. But mm-hmm. similarly, I think people are often positioned in documentaries by makers for very particular reasons that are out of their control and often people will encounter themselves in projects after they've been recorded and feel terrible about the way in which they were represented. It is not the only playground of narrative film where these kinds of dynamics take place. And so it's another layer of consideration Where to Morgan's point, yes, we're thinking about transness specifically, but we are also thinking about documentary as a genre more broadly. And I do think that casting plays a very important role in documentaries, and it's actually just an underattended part of the conversation. I'm going to speak of the participants as actors just for this segment, because as you said, when they're embodying, you know, Barbara and Jimmy and Agnes and so on, they are acting out transcripts. They, they are, you know, speaking them like an actor in a very engaging way. But you only had the transcripts. So can you talk about what you were kind of, how you knew what you wanted them to bring to the role as you were kind of shaping the movie, but also directing them uh, in their performances? That's a pretty easy question to answer because I was not expecting them to bring anything specific. I was hoping that they would come and jam out in real time with us to reckon with the transcripts on stage, in collaboration, in conversation, knowing that there was no wrong way in which to approach the exercise. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that you gain access to in the film are conversations between me and Morgan, between me and Jen, where we're working Mm -hmm. things out, where we're catching problems, where we're recognizing that in the writing process of the film where Morgan and I have assembled thematic chunks and clusters and portions of each of these transcripts, we've missed a part. And therefore, we've Mm -hmm. created some kind of confusion that we then need to work out together in order to keep going. Those are all real-time engagements. And those are only made possible by not having a certain kind of expectation going in. I know that when you're making a movie, the money is so important. Um, I presume there's a just enormous difference between the money you need to make a, a short and the money you need to make a movie of this polish and complexity. Um, You know, again, I'm sure this could be an entire podcast, but what was the process of getting money like in this particular moment? We are grateful for the funding and investment of Telefilm Canada as a part of their Talent to Watch program, which was designed to incubate emerging and often minoritized artists. And I say that and also will say that this was an impossible film to fund. We endured an extraordinary number of grant rejections precisely because if we want to return to the beginning of our conversation, it is very hard to summarize. And it is also very hard to prove without seeing. And... Mm -hmm. I learned a lot as a maker in that process of rejection, thinking about how do we translate our ideas to funding bodies? How do we translate our ideas to juries? How do we explain what we are doing for an often non-trans adjudicating public? And 
you know, I can share a very brief anecdote, which is to say at one point along the way, we received a grant rejection and there was a narrative attached to the rejection that essentially accused me of being transphobic in my desires to think about the legacy of the talk show and to put trans people on stage. Confusing feedback to be sure, but it made me so angry (laughs) that I (laughs) called one of our producers and I said, uh, we don't need any more money. Like, let's make the film with what we have because I'm tired of contorting what we're doing in service of those who have no frame of reference or or understanding. And of course we needed more money, but it was a really (laughs) important turning point for me because I was wasting a lot of time and energy trying to contort toward the fantasy of more money Mm -hmm. or toward the fantasy of more funding. And we are a micro, micro budget film and would have benefited greatly from some more support, but it was important Mm -hmm. to us to be paying people well and to be ethically oriented to what we had. Anything to add, Morgan? No, just that I love that you feel like the film is very polished. Um, because oh it, is, it is so polished. <laughs> it's shiny. Yeah, I, if you had any idea of the comparison between our budget and the budget of most movies, it is like we are a drop in the bucket. Um, people spend yeah. on hair what we spent on our entire film. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think... As Chase is saying, with a project like this, it is very difficult to get, even when you have the blessing of like Canadian funding sources, like national funding Mm -hmm. sources, um, it's very hard to convey even what you want to do with a movie like this, right? And so it took a lot of uh, trust on the part of the funders who did give us money. Um, And I think, thankfully, we've returned on their investment. So go us. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Chase Joint, Morgan M. Page, thank you so much for joining us on Working. We really appreciate it. And I hope everyone can find a way to see Framing Agnes because it is, as I've said, a remarkable film. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Up next, June and I will talk more about Framing Agnes and we'll offer some words of wisdom about interviewing. Stick around. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcasts, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. So, June, I want to start with a question that I love to ask about interviews like this, which is, how did you first come across Framing Agnes? It's a little bit of a saga. Um, <laughs> as is often the case with indie movies, I heard little bits and pieces about it as it screened at various festivals. But as we heard on in the interview, Jules Gill-Peterson, who's the kind of house historian in the movie, is one of the hosts of Slate's Outward podcast, mm-hmm. which I produce. And a few months ago, Outward did a segment on the Netflix documentary Stay On Board, The Leo Baker Story, which is in itself a really interesting documentary, Mm -hmm. uh, this time about a trans skateboarder. And in that segment, the hosts talked with one of that movie's co-directors. And this is a woman with a long history of making documentaries. She was there to talk about her movie and 
she'd just seen Framing Agnes and she couldn't stop like fangirling over Jules. <laughs> and, you know, she should have been talking about her film, but she just like she wanted to, to just like, how did you do that? She was just, yeah. you could tell, genuinely fascinated. So that kind of tipped me off that something was going on here. And then when the movie opened in kind of more cities, Artwood did a segment on Framing Agnes and the host spoke with actress Jen Richards, who appears in the film. And that was also just a fantastic interview. Like, mm-hmm. everybody involved in this movie seems to be a genius, which, you know, <laughs> it's pretty good for a movie. Um, by the way, if you are interested in hearing that interview with Jen Richards, that was the December outward, uh, whose title is How Can Queer People Keep Each Other Safe? Well, I know I'll definitely be seeking out that episode after this. Mm -hmm. Um, But to return to your conversation, I was really struck by Chase's description of a certain line of questioning as violent. I think we often don't think about that possibility enough that being insensitive with our words can be invasive and, yes, violent. Mm -hmm. Obviously, less pressingly, it's a line we also have to walk as journalists who talk to interview subjects, like even Mm -hmm. just on this show. How do you think you make sure that you ask a question sensitively and kindly? Oh, man, it really is one of the key dilemmas of mm. journalism and, you know, by extension, documentary filmmaking and narrative podcast making. And ultimately, I think you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of this question or this mm. line of inquiry? What do I want the audience to learn from this question? Is it something that will be useful to them, that will make their lives better, expand their understanding of something? Mm-hmm. Or is it just sensational or trivial? You know, Chase's phrase really landed for me too, as mm-hmm. did something Morgan said, that trans people are constantly called upon to give an account of themselves to satisfy cis curiosity. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, yeah, that's that's very powerful. And I know exactly what she means. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have to also admit that one thing that makes this complicated is that interviews that involve probing questions, by which, of course, I mean conversations that involve what could seem as aggression or maybe hostility, you know, where you're like holding this person to account and you're, <laughs> you know... They're the ones that get remembered. You Mm -hmm. know, when I was one of the hosts of the original version of The Waves, which was Slate's podcast about, well, still is, but the original version was worked a little differently than the current version. Um, So it's Slate's podcast about feminism and gender. And I was on that show for five or more years. Mm -hmm. We must have done 500, 750 segments, I don't know. And the ones that people always talk about are maybe three to five combative interviews Mm. that we did over that whole period. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that people remember. And, you know, to defend myself after after putting myself on the the line, those interviews were all newsy, you know, so there was a larger purpose. But it really makes it clear that there's an incentive to kind of be aggressive. And and it's like, you just have to be really clear, why am I doing this, you know? Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, it feeds into, I guess, like what we now call like clickbait culture, where it's like there's stuff that editors or I guess managers will know, like will get more clicks, like because it's incensing in some way, Yeah, which is not necessarily the tack you always want to take. Yeah, Um, yeah. I was also really, really impressed by the filmmakers discussion of how feedback loops in a good way ensure that your story is being told in a way that serves the people who are involved with it. Yeah. And that sometimes curation can kind of prevent that from happening. So how do you make sure that the right people are able to give feedback on any given project? And then is there a line after which how much feedback is too much? Yeah. yeah. That brings me to something from the interview that I think I misunderstood the first time Mm -hmm. I heard it, which is when Morgan said that the contemporary performers in the movie were already in their network. And like my initial response to that was like, oh, isn't that nice? You know, it's who you know, isn't it? Right. But now I realize it's not about, oh, you know, once you're in the magic circle, you're minted. It's that <laughs> you need to have trust with collaborators if you yeah. want to do really good, serious, honest work. You have to have a shared understanding of the mission. You need to trust that your feedback will be valued and that you'll be listened to. And that only happens when... There's trust Mm -hmm. when, you know, your life experience is recognized, when you have some kind of shared values. And, you know, it is hard to know 
what's too much when it, it's not easy. There's no, you know, bright lines. But if you're ever in a situation where you ask someone for feedback and then you dismiss what they say is irrelevant or, you know, right. less than another response, you shouldn't have asked for that feedback. And if that ever <laughs> happens to you, like, just remember and just make sure next time around that, you know, you're going to be listened to to the extent that you can control that. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciated the candidness with which they talked about money because mm -hmm. it really is a big thing you start considering more and more the more you're in a particular field. For instance, like for me as a screenwriter, it's manifested in things like knowing that crowd scenes have to be minimal if present at all in animated projects, <laughs> wow. like knowing that my script might sell better if I have a quieter conflict rather than a, like a spaceship exploding <laughs> because that requires CGI. Like how has this kind of thing affected how you think about your work? You know, I've always had a sense that if you want to be given a chance to do something you are really motivated to do, it's mm -hmm. a lot easier to get a green light for a cheap project right. than an expensive one. And once you've gotten that green light, the cheaper it is, the more likely it is to be profitable and therefore to stay in production. But obviously, there's a real danger there that you'll lowball yourself. So... Mm -hmm. You know, the essential element in that calculation is knowing your worth, knowing the worth of one project in your entire portfolio of projects and doing some very clear eyed calculating to make sure you're not being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And if you are, that you know that you, you know, should be able to walk away. But just being really cold about it, I think, is the way to, to be aware of that and just to take it into consideration. I also want to talk a little about breaking typical format, because I think that's part of what makes Framing Agnes so remarkable and also why it caught your attention the way that it did. Yeah. It's tough to do something new in an established field. And it's amazing when you see it happen and happen well. I think more and more this kind of thing is happening, particularly in the documentary field. Yeah. This was a while ago, but I had my socks just totally knocked off by Errol Morris's Wormwood, which is on Netflix, I, I think still, for anyone who might be interested in it, because it unfolds more like how you'd expect a narrative fiction feature to progress mm. rather than a documentary. But I, I mean, I'm sure that partially just has to do with like my own like stereotypes or prejudice about documentary yeah. as a medium. But when do you think breaking a typical format works and when doesn't it? I mean, it works when it works, right? But one, <laughs> but, but I do think, so let me give you an example of something that I've been thinking about recently, mm -hmm. which is the value of dramatization in nonfiction projects. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as we've been talking about, that's a part of Framing Agnes. But my interest in this was sparked by a podcast series from BBC Northern Ireland called The Handler, mm -hmm. which was about a special branch officer, basically, you know, a police detective from the period of the Troubles. Mm. And it was a true story, but some of the details were changed to protect the individual in question. He's still alive. Mm -hmm. And his words were re-recorded by another speaker. Now, BBC Northern Ireland also did something similar in another series with the voices of people who were victimized in the great Northern bank job. So a big, huge, big, huge bank robbery that happened around the time of the Good Friday peace agreements. And that revoicing technique is something that I've kind of associated with Northern Ireland because back in the day, Thatcher outlawed using the actual voices of IRA members on the air. Oh, wow. So broadcasters got around it by having staffers or actors or whoever say the words instead. Mm -hmm. um, you also heard this. It's an Australian podcast that I listened to called The Teacher's Trial. They were covering the court case that stemmed from the podcast The Teacher's Pet. Um, and I guess there are rules against playing audio from trials. Mm-hmm. But they had the transcript, so they had someone read it. Now, in those cases that I just mentioned, the rules were being bent a little bit in order to cover the news. But I think we should be more open to doing that to explore history, either as in the case of the two Northern Irish things that I mentioned, where you need to protect someone who's not going to tell you this, their story if they're going to be you know, in more danger than they've been in because of the situation that they're talking about. But there are so many stories of marginalized people that weren't recorded at the time, you know, to focus on the community that I'm most familiar with. We don't have audio and certainly not video from meetings or protests mm -hmm. or basically 
any part of queer history before the late 70s or even, and even then it was very, very little. And it's not just audio. There's basically one photo from the Stonewall riots. Yeah. And so, you know, and obviously as time goes by, we have less access to the people who were involved in these big historical moments. So can we recreate them and still consider that authentic documentary? I'm not talking about a fictionalized version or taking mm -hmm. characters, but does that still get to be a documentary? So having experienced some very good versions of this and some, you know, some not so good ones too, uh, I'm just very curious about how much we can expand the range of what we consider like acceptable, trustworthy sources of nonfiction information. Yeah, and it, it this is maybe a bit of a, a broader follow up to that, but it does feel like we're on a sort of exciting precipice as far as documentary filmmaking is concerned, yeah. where the push has been like, why do we keep siloing this off to the side as opposed to just regarding it all as like part of the canon of film like there's no yeah. real reason to keep it separate like that the same with like even animation to a certain extent where it's yeah. like there's no reason to separate these things because it's all the same medium it's just like the division between nonfiction and fiction like they're still all books for instance right, but right, there's right. we're only like lessening our own ability to appreciate these artworks by doing that yeah. And I think you're absolutely right that, you know, something you said earlier, that this is where like the innovation is, mm -hmm. you know, it's now something of a cliche to say that, oh, you know, movies are just big, you know, IP blockbusters these days. Obviously, that's not actually true, but it's more true than it was some decades ago. Yeah. And it feels like all of that, like indie underground, low budget, uh, just like, I just want to make something cool stuff has moved to documentary uh, except, of course, for all that terrible uh, true crime crap that's also uh, <laughs> at least. But hey, at least people are getting paid. So there's that. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the show. And if you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and then you'll never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like The Waves and Culture Gap Fest, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thanks to Chase Joint and Morgan Page, and of course, to our amazing producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back next week with Karen's conversation with actor, director, playwright, and now author, Tim Blake Nelson. That's going to be amazing. Until then... Get back to work. <laughs>